Welcome to the VoiceOver PowerPoint presentation for Chapter 19. In Chapter 19, we look at discrimination, or another way to talk about that is when government does not treat people the same or equally under the law. Ensuring equal protection under the law was not seen as a responsibility of the United States government under the original Constitution. In fact, the original Constitution even contemplated slavery with provisions such as eliminating at a future date the uh, slave trade between countries or discussing persons, which they uh, were euphemistically referring to non-citizens uh, that were not going to be receiving equal protection to citizens of the country. In Dred Scott versus Sanford in 1857, one of the most controversial decisions ever made by the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, the court expressed the view that African Americans had no rights under the Constitution, including no right to bring a lawsuit. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were designed to alter this understanding, but they had mixed results which probably isn't a surprise if you've studied American government and American history in any type. The slaughterhouse cases um, in 1873 essentially set aside the privileges or immunities clause. It leaves us with two provisions, uh, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which has largely been used to enshrine uh, civil liberties, and the Equal Protection Law uh, Clause. The Equal Protection Clause is much of what we talk about in combating uh, racial discrimination and ensuring equal protection. United States versus Harris struck down uh, the Ku Klux Klan Act, which allowed uh, for the federal prosecution of racial violence. And the civil rights cases struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which banned private individuals from committing discrimination. So as you see, at least in its early days, uh, the uh, US did not do very much at all to combat discrimination. Following the end of the Civil War, the United States Congress began a process which was termed Reconstruction, or a reincorporating of the uh, states that had seceded from the United States uh, into the American political system, but not without responsibilities uh, for those states to change their ways. In many ways, the Reconstruction era just ran out of time. There had been great hopes in the beginning of changing the uh, political community and even the social order in the South. Uh, but in the end, what mostly happened was Reconstruction ran out of steam. And there's this myth of steady improvement uh, from the time of the Civil War uh, to the future, into the future, uh, that uh, this was a uh, successful effort. But in many respects, uh, African Americans had fewer civil rights at the end of Reconstruction and even fewer civil rights uh, around 1900 than they had had in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. Plessy versus Ferguson uh, was a, a case that in many ways was not seen originally as a major case what it really did was it accepted uh, the social order as it was at the time, and many people were not very surprised by the case or its implications. But the court set out a, a rule, a doctrine, which was used for many years to justify uh, de jure or by law discrimination in the United States. A Plessy versus Ferguson allowed states to enact laws that segregated, uh, saying that the races had a right to political equality, but not social equality. Many of you have heard the term separate but equal. 
And this idea was that as much as possible, the races would be separated and the um, government provision of services uh, was designed to be equal, uh, but was not really in fact. In fact, in many ways, if you uh, consider the way uh, the American system works, a lot of um, a, a lot of the provision of services isn't directly uh, by government, right? Government gives money for things to happen, like the building of uh, water fountains. Uh, but you know how that transitions into what a community actually does is is not direct. And uh, what we saw, especially in the South, but originally also throughout the entire country, was that separate was very different from equal. The process to end separate but equal uh, took a great deal of time. And what we see, especially with the NAACP, that their legal plan was to build up a background of cases that could be used as precedents when it came time to challenging uh, segregation laws. If we look at several of these that are listed, we see that it begins with um, attacking segregation in education, something that is seen as a responsibility of state governments. But if you're going to say that the 14th Amendment requires that the national government uh, impose or uh, requires states to, uh, to provide equality or at least have non-discrimination, uh, then it's a, an appropriate place for government to oversee the actions of states. At least that was the rationale of those who were attacking segregation on a legal basis. Now we get into the bad habit, I suppose, of seeing this, uh, this legal attack as being all of it, right? So in other places, be sure to look at the role of you know, heroic people who did things like register voters or, um, yeah, um, or otherwise, uh, in voluntary situations, uh, accepting and requiring equality in their lives. But if we are in a constitutional law class, we should look at the Constitution and what it is, um, how it is interpreted at various times. Now, obviously, the most significant of these cases is Brown versus Board of Education. And really, both parts of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, we often forget that Brown versus Board of Education began as a, a, a case where the Supreme Court said that segregation was wrong and then actually heard additional hearings, um, an additional argument, uh, in order to determine what to do about it. So. Legal scholars often talk about Brown 1 and Brown 2. Brown versus Board of Education 1 was argued and decided in 1954. Uh, and it determined that segregation created inferior social standing. And unlike these earlier cases that you saw on the previous slide, which actually said uh, we, aren't, we aren't attacking uh, the separation, we're attacking separation when it's unequal. Brown had the insight that the segregation always created an unequal situation by creating two castes within American society. Um, and then, you know, obviously one caste would be seen as higher than the other. When they reheard the case to see how they would implement Brown, they decided that Brown would be implemented by the lower federal courts primarily, and they said that desegregation 
should uh, begin with all deliberate speed. Now, deliberate speed is kind of an oxymoron. It's, uh, it's saying not incredibly quick, but as quickly as it can be reasoned out and uh, implemented. So how was Brown implemented? Well, we see here three uh, major cases, really four major cases, three major cases uh, or three different areas where uh, Brown was implemented. First of all, in this 1958 case, Cooper versus Aaron, it said that local governments couldn't take into account local resistance uh, to desegregation. The desegregation was a requirement and even if it wasn't politically popular, it still had to be done. In these two cases that I linked together in my mind, uh, but were actually separated by four years, Griffin versus Prince Edward County School Board and Green versus uh, School Board of New Kent County, uh, the school boards uh, were told that they could not close schools or uh, create school choice plans or uh, gives people money to go to schools that were non-public um, uh, public schools uh, in order to circumvent uh, segregation. What you saw were a lot of communities would say, well, we're not going to have schools here anymore. We're just going to give everybody who has a child of school age a chance to go to private academies and then those private academies would be allowed to decide whether to be segregated and of course they would be. But the Supreme Court said that that was also not acceptable. In Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg County School, um, Board of Education, a 1971 case, the court actually approved uh, forced busing. Forced busing was actually, or mandatory busing, was actually a positive term at first. It, it came to be attacked and become pejorative, the forced element of it. Uh, but what was really being said was that you had to find ways to allow students to uh, go to school in an in fact or de facto desegregated uh, school. And the only way to do that would be to uh, bus students from one part of town to another. I mean, I suppose, I suppose you could have not bused them and you could have made them get there however they could, uh, but assuming that there was going to be desegregated schools and that there, uh, you weren't going to force people to move, you were going to force people to uh, transport their children to different schools. They're, yeah, you weren't required to take the bus, you were just required to go to a different school. The Supreme Court has implemented a test for discrimination. So in some ways you could say, well, discrimination is only all those times when people aren't treated equally. And there might be good reasons why people wouldn't be treated equally. For instance, if you were hired, their ability to speak Spanish might actually be a requirement of a job where somebody uh, has to you know, go and interview people who only speak Spanish. And if somebody brought a lawsuit and said, well, you're discriminating against me because I don't speak Spanish, then you could say, well, I have a good reason to require that. Well, the Supreme Court said that they would have a strict scrutiny test. If, if a case presented a, an instance of intentional discrimination by a government, the court presumed that the Constitution had been violated. However, if you were going to try to justify that discrimination, you would have some hoops that you had to jump through, right? If your attempts to justify discrimination had a heavy burden of proof, because race in particular is a suspect classification. Uh, so if you are a 
it's not a suspect classification to say that you have to be able to speak a language in order to help people who speak that language. But it is a suspect classification to say, well, you have to belong to a particular race in order to be allowed to speak to somebody or to represent the government. So the litigants enjoyed the advantages of a strict scrutiny test. And strict scrutiny is when we say that um, the test has to be narr narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest. And if there's compelling government interest is insufficient, is insufficient, then the court would strike down uh, discrimination and many uh, legal barriers fell. The Constitution does not permit classifications that penalize historically disadvantaged minorities or that impose distinctions that imply racial inferiority. Extending on this idea, in modern equal protection clause cases, the court has established a three-tiered framework for determining whether the government has engaged in unconstitutional discrimination. This is actually an idea that comes from United States versus Caroline Products Company, 1938. Uh, this was a case that involved interstate commerce and filled milk, and we're not especially interested in the particulars of this case, except that there was a footnote in the opinion that said that certain groups were more likely than others to be the target, target of discrimination. Courts may not always be able to trust legislatures to really be doing what they say they are. And if the uh, classification is facially neutral, the court is allowed to go further and consider the intent of the uh, legislators when they create the law. So, so what is this th three-tiered framework? Well, first there's this triggering question, whether the government's law or action creates a classification that denies a right to some people while giving it to others. Again, we mentioned the ability to speak a foreign language when you're looking for a job. And it, so how would we evaluate that? Well, they said, well, the second step is the court will presume the law creating the classification is valid uh, if it's rationally related to a legitimate state interest. For instance, that the employee is able to communicate with the people we're trying to help. And then three, though, if the classification involves a suspect classification and race especially, but also concepts like religion are suspect classifications, why would you do this? What could possibly be the reason is the question that the court's going to be asking. So race or national origin, the court's going to apply that strict scrutiny test. Is there a compelling government interest? Now, gender has a slightly lower threshold. Now, the difference between strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny, uh, sometimes the court makes that almost no different. This intermediate scrutiny is says important government interest which is supposedly less than compelling government interest. Sometimes that's very different. Sometimes that's only a little bit different. It depends a lot on the membership of the court at a given time. But race and gender and national origin and religion are these types of classifications that we, uh, we, we are very skeptical of and the court has been very skeptical of. Following Brown versus Board of Education, parties began to request the court apply Brown's principles uh, regarding segregation to areas beyond the public education sphere. And the justices continue to uphold our strict scrutiny test, this idea of requiring a compelling government interest. 
In Loving versus Virginia, uh, they struck down miscegenation laws. Uh, these laws are laws that banned interracial marriages and interracial relationships. And uh, they said that, you know, why would you do this? Why would this be required? And there was no legitimate purpose, they said, because marriage is a basic civil right. In Washington versus Davis in 1976, they, they asked a, that a law that is passed to accomplish a legitimate purpose that had no racially discriminatory intent, but has a disparate impact that affects one group more than another. And the, and the court said, no, you can't have too much of a disparate impact, but that proof of discriminatory intent was necessary to invalidate a law. So if there was a disparate impact, it might be a hint to you that this might be a real intent. But unless you could show that the intent was discriminatory, uh, then you couldn't actually win the case. So it can be evidence, but it doesn't, it's not an automatic um, indication. It doesn't automatically mean that the party that's bringing the suit will win. Uh, laws are programs that draw lines on the basis of race but are designed to benefit racial and ethnic minorities, uh, those, are, those are challenging cases, and we're going to see several of those uh, coming up. Affirmative action is one of the most complicated and complex of these problems. Uh, affirmative action programs are designed to benefit uh, groups that are often disadvantaged within society. Uh, affirmative action programs can actually have a couple different ideas, right? And we can say that affirmative action uh, gives preferences to historically disadvantaged groups in areas like hiring or promotion or admission to college. You could also think of it, though, as minority set-aside programs that require government business be awarded to companies. Uh, many minority businesses lack capital and maybe access to loan programs. Minority set-aside programs to reserve a percentage of uh, government business or contracts might also be a type of affirmative action program. In essence, what you're doing is you're trying to ameliorate or fix past discrimination uh, by having programs that at this moment in time are benefiting individuals. Now the challenge though is that that's benefiting an individual at the expense of another individual based on a characteristic that the second individual uh, may, have, uh, may have seen as a benefit but at the same time, in this one case, at this one moment, it, this second individual is being disadvantaged. And so the question becomes, when the government is trying to fix uh, societal problems uh, by giving a leg up to a group that's normally disadvantaged, well, what level of scrutiny do we give that? And obviously if we gave a rational basis of scrutiny that this would give a lot of advantage you'd say well we're we're trying to help somebody we're trying to help somebody who might not have access to this help unless we take into account and find what's holding them back and this what's holding them back might be their racial classification or their gender classification or their national origin classification and so certainly many people would say that if the government just has to have a rational reason for doing it, well, then, you know, then that's, that standard is pretty much, well, if they passed the law, they must have felt that it was rational. And affirmative action programs uh, would probably um, 
would probably fit in this area at least, uh, proponents of affirmative action would say so. And so they don't want strict scrutiny, they want rational basis. And they would say that strict scrutiny should be reserved for classifications that burden minorities. And that the point of strict scrutiny is to uncover racial animus. Now opponents of affirmative action would say that the court should apply strict scrutiny in all cases involving race. That racial classification is never good. And that that would probably be a very big challenge to affirmative action. A lot of affirmative action programs are avowedly taking into account um, past discrimination and then saying this is a group who because of the group membership um, should be benefited. Now, it's possible that you could win even with a strict scrutiny test. In fact, we're going to see that affirmative action has often won even with a strict scrutiny test. And um, because they might benefit the community, they might create a compelling interest. The first major affirmative action case that the Supreme Court decided was Bakke. Uh, it's actually Regents of the University of California versus Bakke in 1978. And this was an Equal Protection Clause challenge to the admissions policies of the University of California at Davis. And this was because uh, the University of California at Davis passed their affirmative action program because they had essentially no minorities uh, in their medical school program. And what they did was they set us up a uh, regular admissions program and a special admissions program. And the special admissions program was designed to give benefits to many groups, but primarily to assure a small group of students uh, who were minorities would be admitted into the program so that they would have a certain number. In fact, We've often talked later about this as being a quota plan. Now, a, a white student, Baki, who was a, uh, a veteran, uh, decided during the war that he wanted to come back and he wanted to um, help people. And so he wanted to get into the, um, into the medical program there. And he had actually been turned down by many schools because they determined that he was too old. And, you know, trying to overcome this uh, discrimination against him for age is some of the reason why he applied to the special admissions program at the University of California, Davis. And he was rejected because they were looking for minority applicants. Now, Baki sued for admission claiming that the university's dual admissions program violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And the state trial court struck down the special program but refused to order Bakke's admission. And the California Supreme Court found the special admissions program to be unconstitutional. So they went to federal court. Now for civil rights groups, uh, the case represented uh, a plan uh, or they were trying to save a plan that was designed to eliminate the effects of past discrimination. And for opponents of affirmative action, they saw this as an opportunity to uh, strike down um, a, uh, a plan that was punishing for past discrimination and to return to a system based on merit. And you'll hear a lot of people who oppose uh, affirmative action to say that the only standard should be merit. To say that the Bakke decision was complex is an understatement. The justices were deeply divided. We actually have uh, two Bakke decisions in a way. Um, justices uh, Berger, Stewart, um, Rehnquist, and Stevens, which passed for the conservative wing of the court at the time, concluded that the university had violated Bakke's rights under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. 
uh, and they didn't go to the counter uh, to the constitutionality of the program, uh, reasoning that if you uh, struck down uh, the struck struck down the system um, using a um, us using a statute, then uh, you could go back and you could alter the statute in a way that would make it um, permissible or that there would be some workable program. Uh, William Brennan and, and four others argued that uh, intermediate scrutiny was the appropriate standard to use uh, in what they call benign discrimination cases. And the uh, University of California's program was constitutional under that analysis. Now, a moderate justice, Justice Powell, actually wrote the decision and he tried to take into account some of the conservative ideas uh, while mostly siding with, um, with Brennan and the others. Uh, he said first that strict scrutiny was the appropriate standard, uh, and you could, but you could take race and ethnicity into account uh, in the admission process. Uh, universities have a compelling interest in achieving a diverse student body. This idea of diversity is uh, new to this time. Uh, the use of quotas was impermissible, so you couldn't have a strict quota system, uh, but you could find ways in order to uh, have a more diverse student uh, population. And that the, the plan violates the Constitution because the university um, segregated minority applicants into a special admissions track. And specifically, it was a win for Baki. He, they, he was uh, ordered to be admitted, but it permitted affirmative action. Um, and the challenge ever since has been finding ways in which um, you can increase, you can seek to increase minority admissions while not having a strict quota system. Although our discussion of affirmative action is often synonymous with the area of education, there's many other uh, types of affirmative action programs that have been evaluated by the Supreme Court. Uh, Richmond versus Crozen in 1989 was a case that involved a minority set-aside program uh, for government uh, hiring or contracting. Uh, it attempted to uh, enhance the prospects of disadvantaged groups by granting them special consideration in awarding government contracts. And although the court had previously upheld uh, set-aside programs, uh, the justices applied a strict scrutiny uh, standard here and struck down uh, the minority set-aside program that Richmond had. Again, this is an example where they said that you can have uh, affirmative action and you can have uh, benefits uh, or uh, scoring benefits, let's say, uh, for uh, being a minority or a minority run business, uh, but that you are not able to have a separate system. Again, you know, it's very difficult to come up with a working plan and probably equally difficult to attack any plan that has justifications for it uh, because of the complexity of the legal um, terrain here. We see that this is not the end of the story uh, with affirmative action in business settings. In Metro Broadcasting versus Federal Communications Commi Commission, the court approved the FCC's use of minority preferences. Uh, this is again preferences, not, not a strict quota, supposedly. Um, Brennan's uh, opinion for the court held that the federal government had an intermediate scrutiny standard. 
I think one of the things that you see during this time in a lot of the cases is that when the conservatives won, they said, well, we're applying strict scrutiny. And when the liberals won, they said, we are applying intermediate scrutiny. Uh, but this doesn't always mean, uh, you know, you also had justices who were switching sides. You also had justices who were leaving and being replaced by others. And, um, you know, what, what we see is the winner's right to decision. But are we, do we have an intermediate scrutiny standard? Do we have a strict scrutiny standard? Um, well, maybe, maybe it's a distinction um, without real meaning. In Adirond Constructors versus Pena in 1995, just five years after, um, we see that having uh, Justice Thomas replace Justice Marshall on the court uh, actually makes a big difference. Thomas opposed affirmative action and uh, all of a sudden strict scrutiny is back. In the 21st century, uh, affirmative action in education has found its way back into the Supreme Court. Uh, two cases decided on the same day, Gratz versus Bollinger and Grutter versus Bollinger, actually had uh, two different opinions, uh, not unlike what we saw in, in Bakke. Overall, you would have to say it was a victory for affirmative action in that the there, there was allowed to be uh, a continuation of uh, affirmative action seeking diversity. Um, and again, that if you had a system that very much seemed like a quota, you know, with strict uh, score bonuses and things, uh, that it would be unconstitutional, uh, like the undergraduate admissions program at, at University of Michigan but that if you had uh, a more amorphous plan uh, that took into account uh, race but that it didn't um, that it didn't actually give huge score bonuses that to all intents and purposes ensured a certain percentage of the students admitted would be of a uh, uh, would be minorities. You see what actually happened at the University of Michigan is they predetermined how many bonus points would be necessary in order to have a certain level of diversity and then they implemented those and the court didn't like that. Uh, but in Grutter, uh, you, the, they had a more of a holistic approach. At least that was the argument that was successfully made by the University of Michigan and that the Supreme Court approved of. Uh, Justice O'Connor, who was, again, at the center of the court for much of the time when she was there, uh, very importantly, as we approach uh, 25 years later, uh, wrote that she uh, expected that within 25 years, the use of racial uh, preferences would no longer be necessary uh, to further the interests approved. She was kind of saying she thought that they were necessary and only because they were necessary were they allowed. And so it's it signaled that uh, the court was going to not pay attention to affirmative action or at least not revisit affirmative action in the short run. Um, but that at a time in the future, they would have a much more negative opinion toward affirmative action. Well, a decade later, in Fisher versus University of Texas, uh, affirmative action came up again. And uh, what ended up happening, interestingly enough, is that right before the decision in that case was when Justice Scalia died. And because uh, Justice Kagan had recused herself from the case. We actually see a four to three decision by the court uh, that upheld str strict scrutiny, said that uh, diversity in the student body was a compelling interest, and that uh, and that it was required that the use of race would be narrowly tailored. However, they argued that the university had showed that they couldn't find a better uh, 
um, more appropriate way. And they said that we've tried other options, they didn't work, and that was part of the facts of the case. And uh, as such, it was seen as a win for um, it was seen as a win for affirmative action. But we also see that in the time since 2016, right, the court has changed dramatically in its membership. And uh, we're, we have another affirmative action case up in front of the Supreme Court uh, that's going to um, be decided next year. Well, not all discrimination is racial discrimination. Uh, we also look at the history of gender discrimination in the United States. And before the 1970s, the Supreme Court uh, typically uh, was favorable or accepting of uh, discrimination or differential treatment between uh, genders. Uh, Bradwell versus Illinois is this case that said that uh, w uh, women um, weren't to practice law. Uh, actually, the court didn't say women weren't allowed to. They only said that Illinois was allowed to prevent women from uh, practicing law. Uh, but you had cases involving voting rights, uh, shorter work hours. Uh, bar women weren't allowed to bartend in Michigan as late as 1948. And uh, in 1961, women were not, well, they were permitted. Um, but Florida automatically uh, didn't allow or struck women from their um, jury pools. And, uh, and a woman sought to be, to get jury duty. That, that, that seems so improbable now. Um, however, we also see after this time a increase in the political power of women uh, that began to push for equal pay for equal work and other uh, civil rights. And, uh, and we see the court start to revisit a lot of these earlier decisions. One of the earliest cases Reed versus Reed in 1971 was a case on whether Idaho uh, would be able to give preference in inheritance uh, to male relatives. Uh, to find a violation, the, stat the challenger would have to demonstrate uh, what was called invidious discrimination and that it was state actors who did so. The court refused to accept Idaho's defense. In fact, the court said that just because it was only a convenience, it wasn't a, a justification for violating the Constitution. And uh, it was an arbitrary favoring of males over females. Uh, and so they rejected it. And they said that um, sex-based assumptions violate the Equal Protection Clause. The Reed case uh, gave evidence that the justices were open to exploring sex discrimination claims and would not hesitate to strike down state laws that were arbitrary in sex classifications using a rational basis test. In Craig versus Bowen in 1976, they considered a law that allowed men who were 21 to purchase alcohol, uh, purchase beer and allowing women who were only 18. Perhaps the rationale was that you would have 18 year old women might be more mature or maybe that 18 year olds would be more likely to be in relationships with men who are a year or two older than they were and therefore that it would allow them to purchase alcohol or to drink alcohol in a social setting. Well, uh, they said that's once impermissible. And they created a new standard, an intermediate or heightened uh, scrutiny standard 
and it required that laws that classify on the basis of sex be substantially related to an important government interest or important government objective. Now, there was a lot of pushback because this was actually a law that struck down the old, a decision that struck down the older rule for, um, for men and lowered the drinking age for men. Now, I don't understand why it didn't raise the drinking age for women, but it didn't. Uh, now, the court has uh, taken the rationale to several other areas. Uh, for instance, in Orr versus Orr, they said that an Alabama law couldn't impose alimony obligations only on husbands, but never on wives. Uh, the court struck down an all-female admission standard for a state university. Um, and in 1996, they struck down uh, the, the uh, Virginia Military Academy had previously been all male. And uh, they had actually created a program at a women's college that was supposedly similar. Uh, but the court said, no, you can't do that. That was, that's right out of separate but equal. And they struck down the all-male uh, admissions policy at VMI and required that they would be desegregated. The court has been more open to laws and distinctions that are based on real physical differences. Uh, in Michael M. versus Superior Court of Sonoma County, 1981, they uphold a st upheld a statutory rape law given the reasoning that women or biological women were the only ones who could become pregnant was an actual sex difference uh, that the majority could take into account. In Rotsker versus Goldberg, they held that the draft law that required men but not women to register for the draft was constitutional. Um, this is something that might or might not be reevaluated into the future, but the rationale is that they needed you know, big, strong men to go fight the wars and that they were looking to quickly raise a combat force and you'd be more likely in a pool of men than in a pool of men and women to find people immediately who would be able to fight. I, I really don't know that that would be the way they would decide if they were evaluating that decision anew today. Um, but the precedent value of this might make it uh, a little bit more likely that it would be upheld in the future. Generally speaking, uh, Congress and the courts have been less supportive of non-discrimination based on sexual orientation. Uh, in 1964, the Civil Rights Act did not include sexual orientation uh, in, in the law. Um, and in fact, at a later time, uh, the US government had passed the Defense of Marriage Act, which denied federal recognition to same-sex marriages. Now, as we've seen before in issues such as sodomy laws, that at first the courts were also largely unsympathetic. However, over time, the Supreme Court became more supportive of, of claims of sexual orientation-based discrimination. In Romer versus Edwards, I'm sorry, in Romer versus Evans in 1996, the court uh, made maybe the first major step toward um, normalizing or, or protecting uh, people who had been on the fringes of society because of their sexual orientation. Uh, most significant probably because it applied equal protection standards to a classification based on sexual orientation. Uh, there was a Colorado law that said that local governments could, um, or I'm sorry, were not allowed to pass laws that protected um, people who were, um, who were gay uh, from discrimination. And uh, the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot specifically set up a group 
that you are allowed to discriminate against. They went much further in United States versus Windsor and they struck down the Defense of Marriage Act saying it was motivated by animus and moral disapproval of homosexuality and said that you had certain rights uh, based on your sexual orientation or at least equal protection. When we think of discrimination, we seldom consider discrimination based on economic status. However, there's probably a great deal of that within our society, both historically and even today. Uh, the uh, economic status of those who are disadvantaged because they're poor has probably become a much larger public policy concern, especially when those uh, differences are small. Obviously, uh, it was very rare that uh, a community would entirely not care about, say, children who were impoverished even you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, right? Um, yeah, I say 50, 60, 70 years ago, and I'm thinking like 1940, but really 70 years ago, I, I, I guess I should be I, I should be thinking what, 1952? Um, anyway, the uh, um, society's views on economic status have changed. Uh, the court standard though, uh, is, is makes it pretty difficult to win cases based on, uh, on economic status discrimination. Uh, the level of scrutiny varies depending on the nature of the civil right in question. Um, and that in a lot of ways, well-being is less, seen less as a fundamental right than the right to be treated equally without respect to those other instances like race and gender and national origin or religion. Uh, if a classification does not burden a fundamental right, uh, then you just get a rational basis standard. Does it make sense? It could be entirely capricious, right? Like deciding that, um, oh, you know, only women can be, I mean, only men can be executors of wills. Uh, but then uh, it becomes, you know, it's much different uh, if we say, well, you know, only rich people uh, have a right to say live in a certain standard of housing would be less seen as fundamental. However, there's some cases. In Harper versus Virginia State Board of Elections, the court struck down the poll taxes as infringing on the fundamental right to vote. And so, you know, they're saying that there's, if there's a poll tax, then, you know, and you have a lot of money, well, then that's not going to, that's not going to affect you. But if you're living paycheck to paycheck and then all of a sudden when there's a right to when there's a an election you have to find an extra say 50 or 100 dollars to vote a lot of people are going to say i can't afford that and so again you know a fundamental right uh, is your uh, income holding you back from that fundamental right Public education becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, Texas, uh, how did Texas fund their public schools? Well, education is a very important state program. And if you change how the funds are going to be distributed, well, that's, that's going to have a huge impact on the school system. And they said that uh, Texas's plan, much like the plans in many other states, uh, was unfair to poor people or people who lived in poor communities, really. I mean, after all, you could be a wealthy person around, surrounded by very poor people. And if you send your kids to public schools, then you might not have uh, the best schools. And you could be a poor person who lives in a wealthy community. Um, I don't know, maybe you you have an apartment in, you know, attached to a million dollar mansion, uh, you, you might actually uh, get to send your kids to very good schools. Um, 
Well, anyway, the question was, are the poor a, sub, a suspect class and whether education is a fundamental right? And the court said, well, the poor, it's hard to define what poor actually is. And education is important, but it's not a fundamental right. Um, and so uh, the Supreme Court refused to strike down Texas and many other uh, state funding mechanisms for schools. So what was the impact of that? Well, it was a huge blow for civil rights advocates. Um, it had a substantial impact on education. Now, some states have actually determined that education in their state is a fundamental right. But where state uh, courts haven't done that, um, it pretty much uh, means that there are very few protections uh, for children, I guess you'd say, in uh, funding of education. Um, it perpetuated inequality. Uh, many states uh, actually changed their funding schemes afterward, uh, but, but they weren't required to. And uh, the, the court held that education is not a fundamental right under the Constitution, and maybe that is the most important of all of those. So that's, that's the end of the uh, voiceovers. Uh, just a reminder, as always, that you know, this, uh, um, this slide is prepared uh, with, uh, with the aid of the Epstein uh, textbook.